the weekly show with David J. Maloney. This week, David chats with Emmy-nominated actress Lee Purcell. And now, here's your host, David J. Maloney. Welcome, everyone, to the weekly show. I'm your host, David J. Maloney. On tonight's show, we've got a really special guest. She's a two-time Emmy-nominated actress whose roles stretch across the decades and involve some of the biggest and brightest names to great show business in the past 40 years. From her breakout role on Adam at 6 a.m. to the cult classic Big Wednesday to her Emmy-nominated roles in Long Road Home and Secret Sins of the Father, she has graced us with some incredible performances while acting alongside the likes of Michael Douglas, Orson Welles, Nicolas Cage, Chadwick Boseman, and so many more. Uh, With us tonight is the wonderful Lee Purcell, so don't go anywhere, we'll be right back. Our featured guest tonight is a two-time Emmy-nominated actress whose craft in both film and television has seen her work with, uh, with a true who's who of the entertainment industry, while gracing us with some truly fantastic performances across the years, from Long Road Home to Big Wednesday to Secret Sins of the Father, and the list goes on and on. Here to chat about her incredible life and career is the great Lee Purcell. Lee, welcome to the show. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. As I mentioned the, in the intro, you've had such an incredible life and career. But before we get into that part of your story, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about a, your early life. Like, what was it? What was life like growing up? As I understand, you were in a military family, yeah? I was in a military family for, um, yes, I had a very uh, nonlinear childhood. A lot of people have linear childhoods. I have no idea what that's like to be born in one place and then you grow up in that place and you have the same two parents your whole life and and so forth, right? I didn't have that. Um, and mine was a bit uh, erratic. And I think uh, in a strange way that has served me well in the entertainment industry because we moved um, so many times. And then at one point we stopped moving and And that was unnatural to me. It was odd. It was like, what, when are we moving? And, and we didn't, um, I, I liked the moving part. I liked being in a new place. Um, and we lived in interesting places and, uh, I liked that. And I did not like it when we stopped moving. So I, I, that might tell you something. I'm not sure. Did you know anybody in L.A. beforehand? I mean, had you lined up anything ahead of time or was this kind of just I don't want to say it was a a leap of faith because seemingly you were very this is what you were going to do. You were driven, obviously. But Mm -hmm. I mean, had you had anything lined up or were you just going to go and just make it happen? It was a leap of faith. I had uh, my grandmother. She lived in California. She lived in L.A. But she wasn't here at the moment because my grandmother was bicoastal. She was bicoastal before anybody even heard the term. Right. And so she was on her her other nursing job in another state uh, where my parents lived. And but she still had an apartment. And so she she gave me the key to her apartment and I drove to L.A. and I had a horrible car accident upon entering L.A. and destroyed my car and nearly died. And uh, and then ended up. It's a long story. And and then ended up uh, finally in, in her after I went to the hospital. And they checked me out. And then I got to her apartment and then I called her and said, this happened. And she said, I'm getting on a plane. And she did uh, because she was uh, really my great champion. And she um, got on a plane, she came out and, and I, I just had, you know, I had a lot of flying glass had hit me in the face and then legs and whatever. But other than that, you know, little bruises and stuff. I, I don't know how I lived through that, but I did. I mean, my car literally flew through the air and rolled several times in the air before wow. it landed upside down on the freeway and then bounced back. So um, I had a guardian angel. I was very aware of that. And and then my uh, and then my grandmother and I went to the wrecking yard, and I said, "Oh, there's my car." And she said, "Where?" And I said, "Right there, where you're looking." And it was this tangled mess it was like it would like it had been through a crusher except for the driver's seat was intact it's really strange i had nothing left in the world everything i mean i had a few bits and pieces that a taxi driver had picked up for me on the freeway he was a wonderful man and um and other than that, i had nothing 
And um, but I had the money I had saved, which I thought would last a long time. It didn't. But I got a job uh, working in a disco. And uh, because I I quickly learned that my little bit of money was not going to last very long. L.A. is expensive. It was expensive even then. And and uh, had a little uh, terrible little one room apartment and really horrible. And but I, you know what? I was thrilled. I was so happy. I was on my own. I was earning money, not much, but I was earning money. I was paying my own bills. I was walking to work because I had no car. And I was utterly happy, as we are sometimes in those in those youthful uh, time periods where we're making our own way and learning what actual life is like. How did you initially start breaking into the industry in L.A.? Was it commercials or, or how did that come about? Well, I had, I was going to, because I was a dancer, I was going to support myself dancing, but I was, I had injured my left knee mm-hmm. in the in the car crash. And even though it eventually healed and I did, was able to go back, but not for a very long time. <clears throat> so um, I got this job in a disco and I was um, selling clothes because the disco was huge and it had a boutique. And so I got a job selling clothes in the, in that. And I started meeting people. I, I vaguely knew this one person and I called him and, and he was like, who? Yeah. And I said, remember, I met you through your family member. And he did a few things for me, but then it, it, it that turned bad pretty quickly. And, um, and my grandmother was of no help. She was a nurse, you know? So uh, even though she was incredible, you know, but certainly not in the entertainment industry. And so I just started to meet people, you know, I worked in the disco, I um, went to acting classes, and singing classes and dance classes and, and um, couldn't dance very well yet. I mean, because of the injury, but then, um, you know, you just, you just gather people to you and uh, like-minded people who are artists and, um, and in the industry. And then somebody said to me, you know, you're tall, you know, you're, you look a certain way, you should model. And I said, oh, God, not that again. And uh, I'd already done that, right? But it was like, I needed to earn more money. So this this was legitimate. The other one wasn't. Um, but this was legitimate. And I got introduced to the biggest modeling agency on the West Coast. They signed me right away. And so I started working as a model. And uh, I wasn't very good at it. And I didn't like it. But it was money. And and then uh, and and was paying for my rent and my food and um, you know my acting classes and so forth because my money was pretty much vanishing real quick and and then um, and then the modeling agency said uh, you know you should do commercials and and I said uh, no I don't want to right now and then. And then later I decided to do commercials. And so I got the list of franchise commercial agents from the union and uh, and started with the A's on the list. And I went to the B's, got, kept getting turned down. A's turned me down, B's turned me down. Ended up in the C's, almost the end of the C's. And I walked in, because I, I didn't know you were supposed to make an appointment, you know, I just showed up and, um, I didn't have, you know, a lot of nice clothes or anything. And so I went to this agency, very posh agency on Sunset Boulevard, walked in the door and I was, I was uh, getting pretty, pretty desperate. And so I said, I'm here to see Mr. Cunningham. And they see your appointment. Nope, I don't. And they said, well, you need to make an appointment. I said, nope, I need to see him today. It's really important. He'll want to see me because you know, when you're young, you have that kind of chutzpah. And, um, and, and and they were curious about this girl. And so they went back and they talked to him and he came out. It was serendipity, total serendipity, unbelievable, really. And it was Bill Cunningham, who was the most amazing person, he was, and he was the biggest commercial agent. So now I had the biggest modeling agency and I had the biggest commercial agent. And it turned out, I found out much later, I reminded him of his daughter. And his daughter had died of a drug overdose. 
not long before that. And he saw something in me that he was afraid that would happen to me, even though there was no way that was going to happen to me. But because of this tragic loss, he decided he he just he was just going to take me under his wing. And that was that. And he did. And I started getting commercials. So I was doing the little bit of modeling and the commercials and still working, you know, in the disco and going to acting class, singing class, dance classes, and so forth. I mean, it, it is amazing what you can do um, in life when you just kind of don't have any options. And uh, so I was doing that and then time passed. And then Bill said to me one day, he called me up and he said, there's a film you ought to audition for. I said, I'm not ready to audition for him. No this, Is this Adam at 6 a.m.? Yes, yeah. And I said, no way am I ready to audition for a film. And and so he, I said, no, I'm not going to do it. I would just embarrass you and me. Everybody. No. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bill kept calling me for two weeks and saying, really, really, I really think you should do this. They're seeing an awful lot of girls are perfect for this. I'm like, mm, no. And finally, he said, you just have to do it. I'm sorry. Just take a leap of faith again and just go do it. And I said, oh, okay, if you put it that way. And so I did. I went and I auditioned for this film, which was called Adam at 6 a.m. It's a very long time ago, but you can still see the film. It's a sweet, sweet film. And uh, nobody was cast. Nobody. None of the cast. None of the roles were cast. And uh, Steve McQueen was producing it for his company, Solar Productions. And I knew that, uh, but I hadn't met him. And I, and I, he was, hard to think of this now, though. It's so strange. But he was of my parents' generation. He was their age, right? And so to me, I hadn't seen a lot of his movies. I think I had seen one, maybe. So I didn't have that kind of um, scary awe that I would have had, maybe if it was more in my age group or it was somebody, you know, younger. Um, I didn't I didn't have that. And so I auditioned. I had five auditions, and they started with 500 girls and got down to five. And... Um, I met him on a Saturday morning and I didn't know I was going to meet him. And uh, I had been through three auditions. I think by that time, the fourth was coming up and they had called it down to, I don't know what that was, 50 maybe. And, um, and so I got a call on Saturday morning and I was out in my yard, my little, little crappy yard. And I was digging and planting flowers because I've always been a gardener. And, um, and I get this call, I hear the phone ring, I rush in the house, answer the phone. And um, they said, you need to come over to the office right away, uh, to the solar offices. And I said, oh, okay, okay. And I thought that was odd, Saturday is odd, right? And uh, so I, I said, I'll come in there in an hour. I need to take a shower. Nope, you don't have time. You have 10 minutes to get here. I'm like, oh, I thought, oh, well, I kind of, in my head, I, I, th- I thought, oh, they probably want to get me some more sides. Those are audition pages that you get probably want to give me some more sides and uh, they're probably closing the office early. They just want me to get there so they can have their Saturday. And I understood that. And so I just jumped on my car, dirty, you know, uh, dirt under my nails, sweaty, hair uh, greasy, you know, uh, because it was hot and, um, and rushed over there and bounded up the stairs because I've been there now so many times and bounded upstairs and yanked open the door and there was Steve McQueen. And it was like, oh, hi. And it's, hi. And he said, um, hi, I'm Steve. And I went, yeah. And uh, I said, I'm, I'm Lee, Lee Purcell. I got a call to come over. I, am I going to pick up some signs or what? And he said, no, we're going to talk. I said, okay. And so we uh, talked for about three hours. People were coming and going and whatever. And we just kept talking. And we talked about everything, literally everything in life that you could think to talk about. Talking about our childhoods, our respective childhoods. They were in a strange way, similar, very, actually very similar, even though not materially, but experientially, they were very similar. And um, and not uh, not great childhoods, and which was okay, because we were both like, hmm, okay, fine, so what? And um, and we talked about motorcycles because I rode motorcycles and he rode motorcycles and talked about acting, talked about life, just talked, you know, and it was easy. It was really easy to talk to him. He was the easiest person in the world to talk to. 
because he had no pretense. Here he was, the biggest movie star in the world, really, at the time. He had no pretense. He was just in an old, I don't know, a sweatshirt and some ripped up jeans, you know. And uh, and we just had a great talk. And I knew it was a test. I knew it the whole time. And um, and so that was it. I went home, prepared for number four audition. I did number four audition. It went well. And I got a call. I was in the final five. And we were going to do uh, a screen test. And that was a bizarre screen test. I've done a lot of screen tests. It was pretty bizarre. And um, we were all driven out to this, to I think the Disney Ranch, one of the maybe one of one of the studio ranches, and we and we were in the same car. We all crammed into this one car, and all five of us. And um, uh, one one girl was a friend of mine, and um, it's very weird. And then and there were no dressing rooms. There was nothing because it was an outdoor scene, right? So we would just kind of go sit on a log until it was our turn. And then we would do our scenes, you know, while everybody else watched. It was like so strange. And um, then we got back in the car and we all went home and that was that. And then I got a call pretty quick, maybe uh, two days. And then I got in the role and it was, I was just floored. I, even though I knew, I knew I was going to get the role by that time. By the fifth, by that screen test, I knew, I knew I was going to get the role. I just knew it. That's how I ended up being mentored by Steve McQueen, because he called me and he said, uh, I want you to, you know, come to the office, you know, frequently, we're going to do this, I'm going to tell you this, because I know you're new. And I was, oh, boy, was I new, and uh, raw. And uh, I said, okay, and I would go there pretty much every day, sit, and, and when he had time, I would talk to him, and then we would work out. And because uh, he said, you're too thin, you need to be, you know, more heavier for this girl, but not fat. And I said, okay. And I started like eating like fried chicken and brownies and whatever. And, and he said, and we're going to work out. So if you don't, um, you know, gain weight incorrectly, I said, fine. So we would do every day, uh, kind of this martial arts kind of exercises. And one day I said to him, so where are you learning all these exercises? And he said, oh, you know, I do martial arts and my martial art, my martial arts instructor, uh, teaches me these exercises. I said, oh, great, you know, and I never asked his name, the martial arts guy, and year, <laughs> you probably know where I'm going. And then years and years later, when I was interviewed, I'm in a lot of in several books about Steve. And um, uh, and the interviewer, I told him that story, and he said, you don't know who that was, the martial? I said, no. And he said, it was Bruce Lee. I'm like, oh, oh, I, I didn't know that. So I was kind of trained by Bruce Lee, uh, one person removed, which was Steve McQueen. And um, and so I actually do some of those exercises to this day. And because uh, they were really good exercises. And and then he just taught me, oh, he taught me so much, just so much. Yeah, he was, he was incredibly smart. I don't know how many people really know that about me. He was incredibly smart. And he was uh, perceptive. He was empathy, had a lot of empathy, and uh, and he was driven like nobody I've ever seen driven, until until Tom Cruise came along, and I was like, oh my gosh, he's like Steve, he's got that that drive and that ambition and that intelligence to back it all up, and that was who Steve was, and he died too young. He died at fifty, and um, he only died ten years. He died ten years later. I was crushed and destroyed and, and he was the best. And I will always, my whole life, I'm always grateful to him because he started, I would have, I would have had a career, but he opened the doors for me that nobody else could have. So it was like being blessed by the Pope, you know? So that was Steve. Is there one piece of advice that sticks out? that he gave you that you feel may have made the most impact on you? Boy, that, that that's kind of a tough one because there was so much over a long period of time. And I remember a lot of them. And some of them I just keep to myself. Um, but one is one is that always always be always understand that everybody's equal on a set, whether they are craft service 
whether they are whether they are the big time producer, you treat everybody with the same respect and kindness. And that has stuck with me all my life. So I, I think that's really important. As I recall, Adam at 6 a.m. was one of Michael Douglas's first film roles. Um, yes. It, what do yes. you remember about the day you met him? I don't remember anything about the day. <laughs> um, but Michael was not a movie star. Yeah. I, I think it was his third film, I think. And um, actually, I was cast before he was. And so I, I then I went through the audition process and as the female lead with all the guys. There were a lot of guys and uh, great, great young actors, all of them, every single one. You could have hired any of them, really. But then one day, and I was doing screen tests with them, and I was doing what's called chemistry tests, and I was just reading in the office and whatever. And then one day, Steve says to me, well, we found Adam. And I went, oh, well, who is it? And, he, and it was so funny looking back on it. He said, um, it's Kirk Douglas' son. I said, oh, what's his name? And he said, Michael. And I went, okay. And he said, you're going to meet him really soon because you're going to start doing, you know, rehearsing and you're going to start doing uh, reading script together. And and I did. And, you know, we were just, we were just two young actors and, you know, looking to, you know, have a career. And he had a leg up, you know, because he was, you know, Hollywood royalty, but he didn't, he didn't depend upon that ever. And he was actually raised by his mother, really, elsewhere. And then, and then, uh, came to Hollywood and he and his dad were very, very close, but, but it was his mother that raised him when he was a youngster. Cause he and his mother, uh, his dad, and his mother were divorced and, but he was very close to his father. And of course, then I ended up starring in a movie with his father. Like, I don't know how many years later, 10 or, or something. And it was, that was like a really interesting kind of full circle, you know, cause he would talk about his dad. And, uh, and I knew his dad was Spartacus and all of that. And, um, and then he said, you know, we, we talked about a lot, Michael and I did, because we were, you know, kids. And, and then, and also they sent us, we did the film together, and then they sent us on a huge tour throughout the United States uh, for the film, to promote the film. And that was really something, really, really something. And um, and one day he, uh, he said, you know, what I really want to do is produce. And I said, well, OK, then you should. And and he said, yeah, I have this uh, project that was my dad's and he can't get it done. But someday I'm going to get it done. And of course, it was one flew of the cuckoo's nest. And he, he sure did get it done. And, you know, he was he was really smart. He was a smart, smart, smart guy. And his dad was really smart. And, um, and, I, and that was great. That was really great. You've, as I mentioned in the intro, you've worked with, I mean, so many of the greatest names in the business, both directors and actors. And, and one that sticks out to me mm -hmm. is uh, Orson Welles. Oh. Um, <laughs> uh, he's such a larger than life figure in the history of cinema to most of us. What can you tell us about your experiences with him? It was the second film I did. Uh, the first one was Adam. The second one was uh, this terrible, terrible film. But, you know, I was young and Adam hadn't come out yet and I needed a job. That's our show for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. And a special thanks to actress Lee Purcell for joining us. Lee will be back again next week for the next part of our interview. So please tune back in. Stay safe, everyone. Bye.